we decide by our actions, by our words, who is going to be active in those circumstances. Now, we've talked about this before, but I, I like to get people to draw a, a circle on a piece of paper, a big round circle, and in the middle of the circle, write the words, the is. And underneath the words, the is, write the word, existence. And underneath the word existence, write the word God. Everything that exists, everything, no matter where it is, exists within God. Anytime you do something or say something that is not within that circle, you've stepped out of the is into the is not, into that which does not exist. Do you understand what I'm saying? When we sin, we're crossing that line out of that circle. So long as we function inside that circle, since everything in it belongs to God and is God and is of God, so long as we stay within that circle, he has a legal right to deal with us. He has a legal right. We have a legal right to call him our father, and he has a legal right to call us his children. When we make the decision to step outside that circle and live our lives doing what we want to do, debauchery, adultery, um, all the things that we're told we shouldn't do, we're actually stepping into Satan's territory. And it's kind of like, if you liken it onto a battlefield, it's like crossing the line into the enemy's territory and thinking that you can keep getting away with playing around in that area without getting caught. Now, every time we do this, every time we step outside that circle, there is a payment that will be exacted by the devil. It may not happen immediately. It may happen years down the road. Case in point, the Bible tells us uh, that we should not defile our bodies. We know scientifically that cigarette smoke, for example, defiles our bodies. It brings about sickness and disease. And uh, once we've done that, we've stepped outside of the laws that govern our existence, and there's a consequence to be paid. Now, we may not die of lung cancer the first cigarette we smoke, maybe 40, 50 years from now, but the devil keeps track of everything. And every time we step outside of that circle, there's a list of debt that, that we accrue against ourselves. Much of that debt, to a lot of people, certain forms of that debt can be washed away once we uh, uh, repent, so to speak. And the word repent means to turn from what we've been doing and turn into a different direction, turn back to God. Now, while God is faithful to forgive us for what we've done, he can't undo the consequences of what, we do, of what we've done. So if we've destroyed our lungs by smoking cigarettes, people can say, well, why don't you pray to God that he'll heal your lungs? I believe that if I prayed to God to prolong my life, that he could do. But he's not going to undo the damage that I've done to my lungs by my own choice. So uh, along that line of thinking, when people pray, they expect that God is just going to say, well, okay, you know, you're praying, this person's praying to me, let me see what I can do here. It doesn't work that way. Prayer, really, even though God hears all prayer and likes to answer all prayer, he can only answer prayer that's within the realm of the laws that he's laid down. Uh, he can't, for example, uh, well, we know that there are certain things that God can't do. He can't lie, for example. It's impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for him to breach his word. So no matter what we may ask him for, if it involves going crosswise to anything that he said, we can expect that that prayer is not going to be answered. If we ask according to his will, anything we ask according to his will, he will bring about. And if we understand that the spiritual there are spiritual laws in effect the same way there are physical laws in effect. We know about the physical laws. We talked about this the other day. Uh, you may not believe in the law of gravity because you can't see it, but if you climb up to the 53rd floor of the Empire State Building and you jump out the window, you're soon going to become a believer in the law of gravity. Uh, and what we need to understand is that the spiritual realm, which created the physical realm, is more real than the physical realm. God is a spirit. He existed always. There was never a time when he did not exist. And he's a spirit. Everything that we see through our telescopes or take in with our senses were created and came out of the spiritual realm. 
So the spiritual realm being more real than the physical realm, there are laws uh, in the spiritual realm that are unchanging, just as certain as the law of gravity and the other uh, known physical laws. They're just as certain, and they're always in effect. There is never a time where they do not work. So if God tells us, if you do this, this, and this, 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 and this will result, the Bible says that the devil stands before the gates of heaven accusing the brethren, the brethren, not the heathen, the brethren. He accuses them day and night unceasingly. He'll do anything. He'll, he'll just turn around and say, oh, look what Vito did today. You call him your son? He's a Christian? Look what he did. And now, of course, God doesn't entertain any of that. But the fact of the matter is, is that doesn't stop the devil from doing it. He's the accuser of the brethren. That's what he does. That's his job. Jesus, on the other hand, is a kind of like our attorney. He's our advocate, while Lucifer is our adversary. And um, so w when people have not established a relationship with God and they want to pray, they're literally treating God like he's a vending machine. They're saying, well, I didn't need you before. I was living my life. I was having lots of fun. I was doing all, all the things I wanted to do. But now that I'm in trouble, I need you. Most of the time, God's not going to have a legal right to get involved in that. You have to take the first step. You have to show uh, both the uh, God and and uh, and Lucifer. And when I say God and Lucifer, I'm not talking about them specifically. I'm talking about all who are looking in on this. And the Bible tells us that planet Earth is a spectacle of all of creation to witness how God has dealt with sin and with mankind. Um, and so while, while they're witnessing this, they're seeing whether or not Lucifer's accusations from the very beginning are true, if there's any merit to them. And on the other hand, God is illustrating who he really is. And one of the things you have to keep in mind is even uh, when these angels were first created, they knew that God was love. What does that mean? They knew that God was all-powerful because he called them into existence, but they didn't quite understand who God was. He's a great mystery to them. He was uh, all might and power. He created everything. So the angels also had to get to know who he was, and what better way to get to know somebody but than to hang out with them. You can't really get to know somebody unless you spend time with them, and uh, the more intimate that time is that you spend with them, the better you get to know them. So what does God do? He allows this thing to take place so that everyone that is witnessing this can say, wow, I didn't know this about God. In fact, uh, Paul says in the book of Ephesians that the purpose of the church was that uh, all the witnesses, everyone in existence, could see through the church, through how he deals with people in the church, the manifold wisdom of God may be revealed. Well, if the manifold wisdom of God has to be revealed, it means that they didn't know it before. The angels didn't know it. The demons didn't know it. Uh, the created beings didn't know it. But this, what's happening here on planet Earth, has given God the opportunity to um, illustrate who he is, that he's a kind and loving entity. He's not just might and power. He uh, said, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Well, what is his spirit? His spirit is a spirit of love. When you stop and think about something that few people uh, I've ever heard, I've never personally heard anybody say this, but um, everything God has ever said, everything he's ever done, anything that you can think of, anything that's in the Bible that tells us about anything God has said or done, he has never done for his own good. He's, everything he's ever said or done was in the realm of complete selflessness. He's done it for the benefit of his, of his creation. Jesus came and illustrated this. Jesus never did anything for himself. There was not a, 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 a speck of selfishness in anything that he ever did. From the time he was born to the time he died. That's what, uh, why we know he was sinless. As we conclude part two of our 10-part series, let me ask you a question, Phil. You are correct in saying that the total selflessness of God is something you don't hear very much about. While we believe that God loves us, we tend to think of God's commands as something he wants us to do, 
to show our obedience to him when actually he wants us to keep his commandments because he loves us so much. He wants us to live and not die at the hands of sin. I hope that in the next segment we can discuss a little bit more about how sin affects our lives and why God wants us to obey him for our own good, not his. I'm also going to ask Geraldine to talk a little bit about our personal experiences over the past 2,500 days. I'm going to also ask you, Phil, to comment on why you think we went through some of the most horrific and trying circumstances of our lives. Well, our time for this segment is just about up. We want to thank all of our Paths to Life followers for listening. And we invite you to join us for our third segment where we discuss how and why sin affects our lives in our everyday living. Thank you again for listening, and may God bless you.